So my name is Christy Zawalski, and I am a physical therapist and research scientist at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And today I have the pleasure of covering the pediatric and adolescent female athlete portion of the female athlete monograph that came out through AOPT. In the monograph, there is a lot of really, really fun information, um, a lot of neat figures and tables and clinical takeaways. But for today's purposes, we're just going to focus on one small portion, and that's injury prevention for young female athletes. And by no means is this a small portion of care and management of injuries among young female athletes, but it's actually a, a really big piece of of what we do as pediatric physical therapists. And so the objective of today is to understand the principles and key components of injury prevention training for young female athletes. And specifically, we're gonna to touch on how to master fundamental movement skills as a young female athlete and how to teach that. And then also how to intervene with our education. Um, PTs are situated in a great spot to be um, not only you know, role models, but also um, you know, be the clinical care provider for some of these young female athletes and, and get them at the, the right place at the right time. And so I think we need to start by just saying we can't prevent every single injury. It's just, it's inevitable that injuries are going to happen. But one of my favorite quotes from a, a great book that I've read is what we're currently doing is manufacturing them, particularly among our young female athletes. And um, this author goes on to say if you intended for a girl to suffer a major injury, you would take away all her other sports before puberty, make her play one sport all year round, and put her in frequent five games and three day tournaments and similarly, similarly crushing athletic crucibles, and then you would just wait. And I think this captures one end of our physical activity spectrum of our young female athletes. Those who are sports specialized and really hone in on one sport and one set of movement skills and one set of movement patterns. Um, but his point in saying this is that we're, we're doing this to a lot of our young athletes and our girls in particular because um, girls are, are in some ways trying to catch up to some of our younger, our boy athletes. Um, but also realizing that we're not going to perform an overhaul on our, our current youth sports system, no matter how professionalized or perhaps broken it may seem. But we can at least try to keep our young girls as safe as possible, but also keep them participating. Because um, we do know that females are 60% more likely than males to stop playing sports by age 14. And injury is, is typically cited as one of the top reasons for dropping out. And so these are some of the girls on the other side of the physical activity spectrum. These are the girls that, you know, might dabble in sports, but then they drop out. Um, injury is certainly a big cause of that, but for other reasons, too. Um, when we think injury, and that's really the purpose of the monograph, we we do know that girls are at increased risk for injuries, particularly before, during, and right after adolescence. And so that's why this group is um, very special uh, to me, is because I think we have this great opportunity when they're at these stages in development to really intervene to keep these girls healthy, but to keep them in the game, because those stats aren't really favorable for our, for our young female athletes, who we would ultimately hope become young adult um, athletes and, and master athletes as well. And so some of the injury risk factors that we see in this group, um, some we can't help. So they're going to go through a growth spurt. They're going to gain some body weight. Their growth plates are going to ossify. Um, you can see the list here. There are some modifiable factors like strength gains, um, alterations in landing mechanics. And some of these are natural. Some of these are just inherent um, injury risk factors. Uh, in our young female adolescents. And so where do we come in as PTs? Our job really, um, the three things that we're gonna cover today is we need to teach them how to move. A lot of our young athletes have those altered biomechanics that are addressable. We can, we can intervene with them. We also need to make them strong. We know that as girls go through puberty, they, um, they tend to not make as many strength gains as our young male athletes. And that, that puts them at a, a bit of a disadvantage, particularly as their proportions change. They get taller, they get wider, um, and they gain some muscle mass. And then finally, we need to make them resilient. And this really comes in the form of some of our educational interventions. And so we'll chat through some of these today. But I think we can really think about 
these three things is giving these girls the building blocks to succeed. Um, and if we can do that and they start to accrue these building blocks, um, ideally we would have them, you know, accrue a lot over time. This would be representative of how physically literate a young female athlete might be. We really want that to happen before peak height velocity. So for most female athletes, this happens around age 12 or 13. Um, we know that when peak height velocity hits, neuroplasticity decreases for these young female athletes. So they're not as moldable um, or malleable. Uh, their movement patterns stabilize. And so if they were taught good movement patterns early on, those tend to stick. If they were not taught good movement patterns or, or we never intervened with them early on, those faulty movement patterns tend to stick through, through peak height velocity and into adolescence. Um, peak height velocity also comes, you know, again, with new proportions. Girls are getting taller, um, wider. Their muscle mass, their fat mass amounts are changing. Their limbs are, are growing longer. And so when we teach them how to move, um, as one of the, the key components here, um, again, talking about physical literacy, ideally we want our young female athletes to have as much physical literacy in the bank as they can before peak height velocity. So can they do all these things and more? Um, just bank it up before, before that, that peak growth starts. Um, today, what I want to chat through is just four very simple fundamental movement patterns. And these are, these are four movements that I, I would never let a young female athlete leave my clinic without mastering because these are some of the basic athletic movements and the bases of some athletic movements that they need to master um, to keep them safe, to keep them healthy, and to keep them moving well. And so we'll talk first about athletic stance. This is really the basis of all athletic movements. If you think of an athletic movement, typically you start here. Um, this is where girls are going to be their strongest, their fastest, if they can just achieve an athletic stance. Um, typically, the cues that I give a young female are stand so I can't knock you down. And when we're doing injury prevention sessions, or if I'm in the clinic with a young female, I'll actually try to push her down so she learns that um, I need to stand rigid and solid so that I, I don't get bumped around. Um, and this is a, a really great place to start when you begin to teach things like a squat. So you start an athletic stance, and then we move to some of the really fundamental movements like a squat. And so the cues here, I, I might have said, sit down in a chair. Make sure your toes can wiggle um, when you're sitting all the way back. That, knows that, that, that tells me that they're sitting back on their heels. Um, if they need some help, you know, hold on to my hands, hold on to a table. But uh, a young female athlete should be able to squat with great form before she leaves the clinic. Um, single leg squatting, very tough for some young female athletes. First, balance can be an issue. Um, so maybe we need to start back a little bit. But a, a single leg squat is also a great uh, fundamental movement skill for these young athletes to master. Hinging. So hinging is a athletic stance, and it's essentially just hinging at the hips. And so this teaches a young female um, or a young athlete just to be able to dissociate their spine from their pelvis which becomes really important in some athletic movements, but it, it's a coordination move. It's not always easy for kids. And so a lot of times what I end up teaching is let's start kneeling, let's start hinging when we're kneeling, um, or you actually put them up against the wall and have them hinge from the wall. And you can see, um, I'll go back to slide. Not so great. We see that rounding of the back. We also see that when she's kneeling and that chest is, is compensating a little bit. But when we put her up against the wall, she looks pretty good with the hinge. And then lastly, that landing. Uh, and we know that a lot of our cutting and pivoting athletes are at high risk of injury upon landing, upon decelerating. And so being able to attenuate a force upon impact is critical for young female athletes, um, particularly our cutting pivoting athletes. And so cues that I typically give these girls, land so I can't hear you. So they learn to absorb forces to cushion that impact um, and then we start to tweak the form. So you'll see we get a little bit of valgus here, a little bit of foot pronation on this female athlete. I think what's harder sometimes is teaching them how to do a single leg landing. Um, but again, we start with the basics and we work our way up, we progress so that, you know, come time for them to step onto a field, these basics are mastered and they're landing with good mechanics and they don't even have to think about it. 
So in addition to moving well, we really want to get these young girls to be strong and accrue muscle mass and bone mass, particularly before the end of adolescence. Um, this we're not going to touch on here, but it is in the monograph, and there are some great photos and great ideas and great tables on what to do and when to do it and how much to do it as far as resistance training, plyometric training, um, training for bone mass accrual. So take a look at the monograph. Um, that's a, a big portion. And then finally, let's make them resilient. And again, this is where some of our educational interventions come to the plate, um, really from a physical therapist standpoint. Um, we've got a great menu of, a great rule set, really, of, um, of education topics um, or, or, you know, pro tips for these young female athletes that is really compiled into um, what we would teach these young females to avoid injury, particularly, I, I think this list is really designed more for our sports specializers who are really into their sport, potentially have um, specialized in one single sport. And so this list, a uh, number of researchers and organizations have come up with, with a list, um, very easy for parents and, and athletes to digest. And so the first, avoiding specialization until late adolescence, um, you know, our, our physical therapy pro tip on top of this would be, you know, that's great. Let's avoid that as, if possible. Um, specializing means that they're just participating in one sport most of the year. But until they specialize, which is okay at an older age, we want them to gain as much exposure to as many movement patterns and movement environments as possible. So maybe you wait until age 16 to specialize in soccer, say, but until age 16, I want you to play ultimate frisbee, I want you to swim, I want you to be uh, on the slopes snowboarding and gaining exposure to tons of different movement patterns, tons of different movement environments. So training hours per week should not exceed age. And our example here is that a 12-year-old should be training at or less than 12 hours per week. And I think the big thing here that we need to educate our young athletes and our parents is that there's a difference between deliberate practice, which would be what most of us think of when we think of structured practice, or you know, she's going to swimming, she's going to soccer practice, versus creative and free play. Um, so a structured soccer practice with a coach and a whistle is very different than you know a girl who's kicking a ball around in the backyard. Um, we just, for safety reasons, and as they're growing, it's just best to keep to this age rule. So 12-year-olds not training more than 12 hours per week. Weekly organized sports hours to free play hours should not exceed two to one. So just another kind of an extension of the, the previous rule. Um, we don't want them to play or to train more uh, than two to one um, as a ratio to their free play hours. Uh, a lot of kids don't actually get free play these days and so I think this is a education point in and of itself is that free play is really important. Um, and this ratio doesn't work if there's no free play. And so free play is no coach, no parents, let the kids play, um, can be outside, can be inside. It's usually where they start to get creative and they try new things, but um, should be not as sport specific, um, particularly if they are involved in just one sport as it is. One team at a time, and this is uh, what we preach at the clinic. Sometimes a, a soccer athlete will come in or a basketball athlete will come in and say, I play basketball. And then you ask them how many teams they play for. And you know they're on three different teams in two different leagues. Um, and that's just not great for growing bodies. So if you're gonna pick one sport, let's pick one team. Avoid playing one sport for more than eight months a year. And um, ideally, uh, you know, if they're playing for eight months a year, let's choose a complementary sport for the other four months. So if you're playing basketball, if you're playing lacrosse, which is you know, cutting, pivoting, lots of impact, maybe let's swim the other four months or let's, um, you know, rock climb and do something totally different for that body. And then at least two rest days per week. And sometimes this is hard to preach 
uh, particularly to parents who are excited about signing their kids up for extra training and extra practice or you know a three-day tournament but really kids need two rest days per week what we're going to say on top of that is that active rest is better so that doesn't mean your two rest days are on the couch that means that um, you know, you're taking walks, or you're going swimming, or you're, you know, that's where the free play comes in. But we're just not doing the sport specific sport on that, on those rest days. And so, uh, in conclusion, uh, obviously we're not going to prevent every injury for these young female athletes. But I think to get us started, um, particularly as physical therapists and movement experts, we do need to teach these girls how to move. We need to make them really, really strong and then keep them resilient. So thanks so much. Um, feel free to reach out to me via email and enjoy the monitor.